All right, so we're going to do another update of this tower defense thing. I, I am very excited about this. We actually got rendering going where I can move objects around, and, and it's sent down to the NeoVim client. Here is an example of an X moving back and forth, and notice that there's four connections just being taken down, put back up, taken down, put back up. I usually let this thing just run for hours just to make sure that I don't accidentally hit some sort of weird edge case, such as a memory leak or anything. It just keeps running on my system. I'm going to come up with like a really good integration test that does like 10,000 connections. But for now, here we go. This is looking fine. Happy about it. So how what we do? How do we do this? Well, I did a, actually a dumb implementation to begin with, but we're going to do something a little bit better. So I don't know anything about game engines. I don't know any of this. We're just kind of raw dogging it, having fun. And it's really a, a real-time ASCII game engine is the goal here. So the basic idea of what I did is that I'm going to build a big board. And how I actually built this underneath the hood is just simply one really long array and I have things in here called a cell a cell simply contains uh, two colors the foreground color the background color because remember text can be both colored on the front and in the back and then the value which is like an ASCII value that's it we're not doing Unicode or anything else besides for that just simply an ASCII value and here we go so we have this beautiful cell format that actually is a 2d array but it's represented as a 1d array and anytime you're given a value I go and check is it within this cell list so pretend you actually had something that was say a two by two but its location was negative one negative one which would mean that three out of four squares would be outside of the viewport whereas only one square would be inside the viewport so i have to go through and kind of create this kind of complex little and uh, uh translation that makes sure first is the thing within the viewport and which ones are in the viewport but the harder thing and i did a really simple implementation for this one is that how do i tell between renders what has changed and what partial information do i need to send down to the client in the most minimal possible way so uh if you want to take a look at just this absurdness i can go way over here and go into this beautiful render renderer -er -er -er. uh, and the basic idea is that first off i do a bunch of encoding just a bunch of marshalling just so that way we can marshal data back and forth between uh, neovim and this go server but the general idea is that i have three buffers uh the first one is a is just like the current buffer the one is the previous one then I have one called clean clean is just simply the empty buffer with just all the default characters in there foreground background and empty space and so that way I can do a really kind of quick copy to the new buffer from the clean buffer over and over again and then I create this and then the general idea here is that you can add renderables right renderables are a list of things that need to be rendered to be put on the canvas I also have this a notion of Z ordering I just haven't programmed it in yet because I haven't needed to use it and so we insert it with a quick little binary search and we find the first z index that the same as ours or we find the closest index we can to where we need to be and then we insert it right into there so kind of like a little fun binary search that we had to do removing i literally just uh removing i literally just go through it and find the id and the first id that matches i break it out and just remove it i know linear search i know it's stupid because remember our array is sorted by z it's not sorted by id kind of kind of crazy here and so here's where the real big sauce happens is right here inside this uh place function so every time i call render i try to place all of the items onto the board and what i do is i call this translate function this translating function takes each one of the cells that come out and sees and, and checks is it on the board it does this check right here and you know this one wasn't that bad to write it just looks really disgusting but i just say hey does it exceed the bounds and here you go here's the place that it needs to be because here's the basic equation i just wanted to make sure that it didn't exceed any of the bounds and so by by just simply doing that it allows me to go hey if it exceeds we continue else we're going to write it into the buffer now here's the part that i want to make better and i actually have a really good idea and i'll explain why, how i'm going to make it better but at first i just didn't care right so first we just literally check every single cell against the previous cell buffer against previous and just sit there and check every one of them anytime that there is one that's missing i create a new cell with location meaning this cell in this location has changed and then i'm just going to whole dog write it to the client no compression no nothing special yet just really simple stuff and then i save out the previous render so just in case you need to call render again like if a new client joins i have access to it then i take the pre the previous buffer and copy in the new buffer into it then i take the new buffer and copy in the clean buffer so we start from again a pristine state pretty simple stuff right we just do this over and over again we're rendering at not a super fast rate obviously we can do this stuff way way better but for now i think this is probably about as easy as it gets just to make this thing work and so the idea though this is where the cool part is the idea of how do we do something in which i don't have to check the whole buffer and i can do small things and i can only reset small amounts of space well the general idea is this is that 
if I store the previous location of any of these renderables, so say this one's negative one, one, and then the next time I render it, it's zero, zero, meaning that now I have all four on here. Well, what I can do is I can take the previous location and I can say, hey, all of those and the new location have changed. So in other words, these four would all make it into this array. And these would all be like, hey, these four positions have changed. These three that are on the outside have not changed. So anytime if something moves, say from uh, X, Y, all the way over here to X prime, Y prime, well, guess what? I just say, hey, X, Y and X, uh, X prime, Y prime have both changed and added to this change list. So it makes it super easy for me both to write in these new changes, but also to not have to keep a previous buffer because I keep previous positions instead. And I can tell if an object has changed, if it's location or its cell has changed, meaning it's being colored anew. And so I think this is a pretty kind of a more cleverish way to go about everything because instead of having to check every single cell, I only have to check the locations that have changed. So I think it's pretty dang clever. It should work out pretty good. I should be able to send very little information and really reduce the amount of CPU, but I didn't want to do this yet because I don't want to have to take all the time and write all that stuff in. I want something that works because with these changes that we've made so far and with this little animation right here, all I have to do is put in the coloring because I am sending down color information for these X's. I'm just not putting it in yet for NeoVim. What I can do is that this is what I think is really fantastic. So this is what the next few streams are going to be about is that I'm going to create a particle effect. Effectively, I'm going to have like, say, 10 particles and they're going to all make kind of like, you know, most of them are going to come up the center and then they're going to kind of widen out out to the side. And every time there's a couple more particles there are in one spot, the more yellow it's going to be, the less uh, particles in the spot, the more red it's going to be. And then, of course, based on the lifetime is how dark or bright those colors are going to be. So yellow should always be bright, maybe nearing white, and the outside should be all red. In other words, I'm going to make a fire in ASCII using particles. I think it's going to be pretty cool. And then that way you could have this live particle. And so if I opened up four windows, it would all have the exact same fire being displayed at all times. And then I'll use that as my kind of my bed for measurement. Like, hey, here's a worst case scenario of be, me changing a bunch of items. What does this look like? How much data am I transferring down? Because the next task after this is, can I make my message format smaller if I need to? What I'm kind of personally thinking is that I could provide a static Huffman encoding on a per game basis. Because my games will know what are the most most popular characters versus the least popular characters. And then to be able to take that and actually create a really slick uh, Huffman encoding, I don't know, it could work out or B, we just tried G zipping each packet. We don't know yet. We don't know where this is going, but I am pretty dang excited about this whole situation. I think it's going to be a lot of fun. And so, yeah, I'm happy where everything's going. And now all I have left to do is uh, get in the coloring, do a little bit of particle effect. And guess what? Guess what? It's time for tower defense. Oh yeah, we are gonna build that tower defense here so dang soon. I am so excited about it. I cannot wait. We are just like this close. We're this close to getting our first version out to where we actually make a game with where 4,000 plus people can play at the exact same time. And we will really truly prove, is chat smarter than me? Which they're not, should be an easy proof.